People here that are new, um, I am Mr. Auerbach, uh, many of you know that, um, but I will not be your science teacher today. Um, this is uh, Mr. Andy, Andy Reitzman and Cor Toington? Tro Trowbridge. Trowbridge. Trowbridge, I'm so sorry, I, okay. I, I, got, I got some of it. Yeah. Um, uh, Mr. Reitzman <laughs> is a filmmaker who lives out of Marlboro, if I'm not mistaken, cool. uh, and um, uh, Mr. Trowbridge. I did that right, yeah. is from BCTV, she's filming this for us, and uh, uh, UHS TV is filming this. This is our second in series of filmmaking workshops, and today we're going to be talking about how to do production. And so, I give you Andy Briggs. Thank you. Now, how, most of you, some of you, were at the workshop a few weeks ago. Uh, the, 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 the people who just came in, you were not at that workshop, correct? Okay, so let me quickly explain. Uh, I worked on a film that, that is a collaborative effort by about 40 Vermont filmmakers called the Vermont Movie. It's turned into a nine-hour film all about Vermont. There's a million topics and all kinds of stuff. Uh, they are having a contest, a film contest, cash prizes. Uh, I believe it's $500 for first place. Um, to make films uh, about Vermont. It can be pretty tangential. It can be a narrative film, a documentary film, an experimental film. It, it, there should be some connection to Vermont. Uh, a lot of people would be making documentaries. But uh, so uh, these workshops are being set up all over the state in order to uh, help students who are interested in participating in this competition uh, become a little bit more adept at filmmaking. So that's what we're doing here. The first, uh, the first class, we talked about uh, brainstorming ideas and coming up with ideas for films and what makes a good film and that kind of thing. Uh, today, we're going to actually talk about shooting and interviewing people and all, all that kind of stuff. So uh, the first thing I'm going to do is call on Abby for a second. Uh, I'm calling on her because I know that she has a film project in mind. So can you tell us what your film is going to be about? Um, I'm planning on doing a film about why so many young people are leaving Vermont and going to live in different places. Um, and also, well, I want to interview a bunch of students on where they're like planning on going to school and why maybe they don't feel that Vermont is the best fit for them. And then also I want to interview adults who maybe never left Vermont and see the other side of it too. And why did you pick that topic? Uh, because I want to go to school in California, and I don't really feel like I'm like supposed to live in Vermont for my adult life. So it's kind of just because it would made sense for me to make wanting to leave so bad. So. And it's I mean I assume it's a subject you're interested in and care about. Yeah. 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 And it's the like I was doing some research and like the average workforce age of the workforce in Vermont is like 48 to 64, so, I mean, there's not a lot of young people here. So you've done a fair amount of research on the topic? Mm -hmm. What kind of things, uh, I'm just curious. Um, well, like that, and just that some of the reason is because there's not a lot of new companies being developed in Vermont, and not a lot of new jobs for like the digital age, which is also because I want to go into like television production, and there's not really a lot of jobs for me here, so. Cool. Yeah. You know, the, the kinds of things that we, that I want to just reiterate from the earlier workshop, you know, it's best to pick a, a subject that you're passionate about, that you care about. It's very important to do research, like Abby's doing, to find out as much as you can. Think about who you're going to film. Abby talked about filming students, but also the other half of the equation, which is, um, the older people who've stayed in Vermont. Uh, are you going to have a point of view? Just show both sides of the story, you know, what Vermont has and maybe what it doesn't have. Sure, OK. And you know, a lot of films do that. They show both sides. They don't really want to take a stance. They want to just investigate an issue. Some films are very much advocacy, where they're pushing to make a point, to make a case about uh, a particular topic, often political films. Michael Moore, I don't know if you know Michael Moore's films, but he has a very strong opinion about the world, and, and he expresses that in his film. So uh, what I'm going to do is start by showing something like an eight-minute part of the Vermont movie. Uh, we'll take a look at it, and then we'll talk about it and uh, go from there. <laughs>
you know, the marble around here was, it was an ancient seabed, and it was tropical, you know, it was totally different. You wouldn't recognize it now, that's for sure. At one time, there was five or six different marble companies here, and then there was marble sheds all over the place. The Irish are here first, so they, you know, they consider themselves better. They become bosses in the quarry, and they would tell the, the Polak, now you better pay attention here, otherwise we're going to send you back to Poland. Their first day of work, they'd go down there in sneakers, and then 40 degree temperature, you need something warmer than that. When you came to the door, you ended up on a face, so you just kept going, and you drop down, and you keep going, and you drop down, and when you get to this side, here, it takes an awful jump, the bed does. It's hard to going up like that because everything's back at you. The Proctor family took over all these small marble companies. They turned things around and did a great job of it. The Proctor family consolidated the industry into one corporation, the Vermont Marble Company, which they really ran like it was a medieval fiefdom. Redfield Proctor sent recruiters to Sweden in order to bring Swedes back to form management. And Swedes, it turns out, can become Vermonters a lot faster than Italians or Irish can. They are sober and they're temperate and hardworking and they're Protestant. So what Proctor did was create a buffer between himself and the Irish and French Canadian and Italian workers below them. I did ask myself, I wonder, what the heck you doing here? Every time he blasted, that's when he asked Yeah, himself, that's when he asked because they really would shit the place up. The town was split up in sections you had a section where the Swedes lived. Of course, West Rutland where all the Polish people were. Rutland used to be one big town at the time. And he went to the state legislature and saw to it that West Rutland was separated from Rutland and that the village of Sutherland Falls where he lived was separated into its own town, which he humbly named Proctor, of course. They got in politically in the Montpelier. The Proctors were governors. Politically, they benefited. It was said that nothing got done in Vermont unless the Proctors approved of it. They were an extremely powerful family. Marble always starts out as some sort of limestone. Limestone is a rock made up of the mineral calcium carbonate, what we call calcite. Calcite forms as a result of some sort of biogenic process where you have either a very, very small microscopic or a macroscopic shelled organism. And when the organisms die, their shells then fall to the bottom of the ocean. And the fragments start to coalesce into larger crystals. And under the right circumstances, you can wind up with a, a marble that's very white and very clean looking, like the Danube marbles. Right there in Proctor, they used to have a carbon section right there. That's where they made all the big pillars and stuff, they were carbon. The supervisor would teach them how to do it. It was mostly manual work. And the chanting machine was a simple operation down in the quarry. It was a series of drills that just keep cutting marble, and then the block would be popped out with wedges. Marble is not the hardest of stones. It's actually porous and does start to show the effects of time and weather. That's one of the things that makes marble such a good stone to be using for sculpture or buildings, because it's very easy to work it and mill it into the shape that you want. You lay the stone and you know it's going to stay there and you know it's going to be there and you've made a mark on the world and that's a good mark. So how are we doing on health care? That's what we're working on. Okay. I live not far from the marble quarries and that was our playground. We used to go down in the first quarry and go down through the tunnels and come out in the last quarry. <laughs> If you didn't go to college in this town, that's where you went to work. What would the marble company do without these immigrants coming in? That's why they provided homes for them, because, you know, they needed them. Everything was right here. Like, my grandfather never had a car until he was in his 60s, I would say. He never needed them. The company store was right there. They'd buy on credit, and the deductions would be made from their paycheck. And the same with the rent on their duplex company houses that they lived in. The good things about paternalism, the workers were reasonably well taken care of, and the Proctor family could feel proud of their tradition of how they treated their workers. But obviously, there was a lot of control that they exerted over their workers as well. On one hand, they were very good to the work. On the other hand, they underpaid. And the marble company didn't provide the protection that they do today. Hard hats, now there wasn't a hard hat down in the quarry. 
a piece of marble as big as my hand would kill you. There were a lot of fatalities there. The mother would become a widow with five or six kids, and there was no welfare in those days. Some, some thoughts about that. Um, first of all, there's an issue of preparing for the interview. And it's great to write down, write down your questions. Think about what do you want to get out of this person? What do, you, what do they have to offer to your film? And therefore, what, what can you ask them? Uh, and having it on paper means that when you're sitting in front of that person, you have some notes to, to help you. At the same time, I think it's really important when you're, a, when you're an interviewer to be listening very carefully to what the person is saying. Because they may say something that you're not anticipating that's worth following up. And it may not be in your questions that they're talking about this new thing. And so you need to be listening and open to the idea that there are other issues that may come up that will be fascinating that you should be following up on. Also, a lot of times people speak for a period of time and then they stop. And it's very easy to think, oh, oh my gosh, it, there's silence. I better, I better ask the next question. Sometimes if you just relax and be comfortable with some silence, the person digs a little deeper and gets something more interesting or more important that they think of. So don't, don't feel that you need to fill the void. Uh, l let there be p potentially periods of science. Uh, of silence. Can, um, I, can I just say, yeah. because you can edit anything out, right? You're going to put in the stuff you want. If right. somebody's silent for 45 seconds, if they pick their nose, it doesn't matter. If they sneeze and the big booger comes out, I mean, yeah. let all that stuff be. Now, most, in most cases, when you're making a film, uh, your questions are not going to be in the film. So you ask the person, you know, why is such and such important? Why, you know, why is uh, energy conservation important, let's say? If they say it's important because, your audience may not necessarily know what it refers to. So it's good to ask the, the person at the beginning of the interview to say, can you incorporate my, uh, my question into the answer? So when they answer a question, instead of saying it is important, They'll say, energy conservation is important because, and then you can use that sentence. Sometimes when they say it, it suddenly, you can't really use it because there's no reference to what it is. Um, I usually give them an example. You know, I say, you know, I often say to people, if I ask you what's your favorite color and you say blue, I don't know that, I mean, for all, for all my audience knows, I asked what color is the sky. And the answer is blue. So if they, in, the, in the case of that question, they would say, my favorite color is blue. And then we know what they're talking about. Um, uh, try not to ask questions that, that are answered with a yes or no. So instead of, uh, I mean, uh, instead of saying, do you believe in the legislation of marijuana, if you said, there's been a lot of press lately about, uh, about legalization of mar marijuana. How do you feel about that? They're not going to say yes or no. They're going to have to actually answer with substance. Um, let me see what else. So, so now I, I want to uh, show you guys a couple of interviews that I've done to talk about the options. So here is. And, and I'm glad I could. It was rare that I actually saw him laying paint down, but there were times that, uh... Okay, first of all, when I like, uh, there, there's something called the rule of thirds, which is the idea that, uh, that an interesting composition often involves one th uh, something placed at one third of the screen. And if you look at a lot of, for instance, Renaissance paintings or classical paintings, you'll, you'll see that there's something important in the frame at the one third point. So this guy, if you split the screen into thirds, he's pretty much in the third. Uh, most filmmakers do not put people in the middle of the frame, which is a very common tendency for people to, to say, oh, this person is important, I'll put him in the middle of the frame. But it's, it's just sort of, it's a slightly more um, energetic frame. Uh, so, so I put the person on either side, one third or the other. Uh, I also like to separate the person from the, the space behind them. And the further I can get them away from the wall, 
the better. So, so for instance, if I was filming in this room, I would not put the, put the person way at the back of the room. I would have them maybe here. And my camera would be here. And then I have a lot of space behind them. Uh, I also don't like flatness behind a person. So I usually try to have the back wall to some degree at an angle, uh, which is just, again, a little more dynamic. Uh, now, uh, in terms of lighting, uh, usually uh, the most modeled three-dimensional look you can get is uh, to have one side of the face sort of more illuminated and another side sort of falling off to darkness. Uh, the classic uh, lighting pattern for an interview is called three-point lighting. There's one main light, it's called the key light. And the key light is, a, is the brightest light that you're using. Then there's a fill light. The fill light puts a little bit of light on the other side of the face, less, so that this side is brighter, this side is darker. And then often you put a backlight, which where, where, where you would see a separation between uh, the interviewee's head and the space behind him. Now, I know that I understand that you guys are not necessarily in the position to be using a lot of lights. Uh, this, that's just sort of the ideal. Uh, you know, if I'm in a room that has windows like these, I'll use the daylight. And actually, you know, if I go over here, you'll see that uh, if, I'm, if I'm standing in this kind of attitude, this side is being fairly well lit by the windows, and this side is being less lit by the windows. Uh, I don't have a backlight, but you can't have everything. So um, there are a lot of ways, there are a lot of choices in a particular room that can let you have decent lighting without actually bringing all this lighting gear. Uh, I'll talk about audio for a second. It, it's really important, particularly when you're doing interviews, to get good audio. Uh, and good audio, there's a very simple rule about audio. The closer the microphone is to the person, to their lips, the better audio you're going to get. So for instance, today I'm wearing a little microphone here. This microphone is picking up my voice quite a bit because my, vo my, my mouth is right very close to it. So for instance, the noise of this um, uh, projector is because, uh, because Core can turn the audio down because I'm so close, that means all the room sound is going to get quiet as well. So uh, you really want to have, if possible, you want to have an external microphone on your camera. You can't, you know, it, you know actually, Abby, you're going to have a, a less good audio than if you had a microphone that was right here. Now, there's a few ways to do that. There's, there's, uh, there's a boom pole that has a microphone attached and a, and, and a cable to the uh, camera. So that's one way. Another way is to have a mic stand and put the mic on a mic stand. Another way is to have a lavalier, which is this kind of small microphone that you attach to someone. And that can have a wire back to the camera, or it can be wireless. In this case, I have a little transmitter, and it's sending a signal to the camera. And, and, uh, and that's really convenient, because it means I can move around, and I don't have to worry about my, about my cable. But uh, if you don't have a uh, microphone, external microphone, then it's important that you put the camera close to the subject. Because the camera mic is probably OK. It's not great. Uh, but if, you're, if the subject is fairly close to it, it'll be better than me being 20 feet away from that, that microphone. Another thing about interviewing is you don't necessarily have to sit somebody down in a chair and interview them in that kind of static way. A lot of people, particularly the woman who, who is the uh, creator of the Vermont movie, was is really interested in, in interviewing people while they're working. So they're doing something, uh, and while they're doing something, they're talking. And in fact, I'm going to switch real quick, and I'm going to show you a little uh, thing that I uh, shot. Yeah, this is a lilac bridge film. So here's a scene which demonstrates that, that idea. They're helping somebody get out of the mud. I'm trying to not complain about the things I can't change, like the weather. Just, um, you know, look creatively. Yeah. But yeah, today we were like 
all strawberries, we would be so disappointed and definitely economically impacted by the weather. We've had torrential downpours of one inch, two inches, three inches. Um, so they get, they taste a little watery, they get moldy. So now we're doing sort of a last chance pick where we are still picking because it's out there. And this is one of our potentially most profitable crops. But we've lost a lot of it, but we're still trying to get out what we can. But, you know, when something goes bad in a diversified system, usually something benefits. So we have some crops that are looking fine, looking good. Good mother, wow. <laughs> this is just this week. It's, uh, it's our fourth day of sun in a row. I think that's unprecedented. By far, uh, uh, oh, wow. a record by at least two days. <laughs> We didn't have strawberries season too. Yeah, and, and watermelons. Our watermelons, any of our melons, have barely, barely grown this year. Things just haven't had the sun to grow, and that's an important part. Okay, so so that's an example of where she's picking strawberries, but she's talking about the form, the farm, and how it's a diverse farm, and and they don't rely just on strawberries. They they have other things, uh, and you'll also notice very important that when I was filming her. I didn't just film her talking. I got shots of her picking her hands, uh, close up. Uh, I got a variety of shots. And the reason for that is it sounds, because my wife is a really good editor, that sounds like one con continuous uh, statement by her that, she's, that this is what she said. But in fact, she said a whole lot of other things that didn't necessarily relate or weren't or relevant or as interesting to us as this. So we wanted to cut out parts of her audio and just use the parts that we wanted to use. And by filming those close-ups, we're able to cut to a shot and then move to another piece of what she's saying. And that is a really important aspect of, you know, when we get into post-production, and unfortunately, you have to film before you edit. Uh, and sometimes you find when you're, you're in the editing room and you sort of have, have handcuffed yourself because you don't have ways to eliminate some of the material that you don't want. Uh, let's see what else. Um, OK, now in terms of your camera, uh, there, there can be a, a tendency, a lot of these cameras today have a lot of automatic settings. You put it on automatic exposure. You put it on automatic focus. And you just shoot. It's a little bit tricky because, for instance, uh, if I've had interviews where, where, where somebody gestures with their hand, and their hand goes up in front of their, their face, and it gets a lot more light, the hand is suddenly reflecting more light than the face. And if you're on automatic exposure, all of a sudden the camera's going to compensate and it's going to get a little darker. And then when the hand moves away, the camera is going to adjust again, and it's going to get a little bit lighter. And that is really the perfect sign of amateur uh, camera work. If you're on manual exposure, when the hand comes up, the camera doesn't change. When the hand goes away, it doesn't change. It just, it just remains the same exposure. Uh, and uh, you can, I mean, it's perfectly fine. You can use the automatic exposure. The cameras uh, are pretty good at finding the right exposure. So you can set up your shot and use automatic exposure and then put it on manual and then it won't change. So the camera helped you get the exposure, but you aren't now stuck with the camera deciding what you want. Focus is, is the same thing. Sometimes somebody puts their hand in front of their face and the camera decides this is what I should focus on and it changes the focus. And then it changes back when the hand goes away. And that, again, is, uh, is, is a little bit disturbing. Um, uh, and that's, again, that's, that's focus versus exposure. The first time I was talking about exposure, then I'm talking about focus and both of those things. Uh, the other thing about focus that's really important is 
the, the best way to focus a camera is you zoom in all the way, you get focus, you get it really focused, and then you zoom back out. That's the only way you really know you're in focus. If you're, if you're on the wide end of the lens, if you're all the way uh, with, the, uh, with, the, with the lens wider, showing more, uh, you don't know that you're in focus because as you zoom in, it may, not be, it may not stay in focus. So it's really good whenever you set up a shot, you zoom in, you get your focus, and then you back, then you back off. Okay, so the, here's an interview with Vern Grubinger. You're the first uh, on-farm biodiesel plant to get money in Vermont. And John Williamson is a really smart guy who figured out how to grow all the ingredients. Okay, so let's look at this thing for a minute. First of all, notice lavalier microphone. The audio is good. Listen the, to his um, audio. Oil part of it, and also he's been working on growing the alcohol crops. That's, are... that's good audio. Now, in terms of the lighting, th they got a little carried away, a teeny bit carried away, which is that, I mean, it's actually, in some cases, people would, you know, certain cameramen would, would really like this. They're using the light from the window. There's no, I don't think there's any lighting involved in this. Um, but they've placed him in a place where he's getting lit. If he had been a little bit turned more, then this side of his face wouldn't be quite so dark. It's a little too dark for this kind of an interview. I mean, if, if, he, was, uh, if he was a horror film director um, or, or you know, something else where he's talking about dark stuff, that might be, uh, it might be appropriate. I mean, it's fine. It's, uh, it's, you know, if you guys get an interview that looks like this, I will praise you and say good work. Um, you know, he's very close to the background. That's the kind of thing where you saw in my interview, there was a lot more space. I also totally understand that you guys don't have quite as much uh, leeway. You know, when I go to shoot an interview, often I've, I've already been there to look and see what the options are and thought about what's the best place to film and how can I get further away. Maybe I'll suggest a different room if I don't like that room. You guys probably aren't going to have that luxury. So you have to make the best of, uh, of the situation. And I know there's plenty of cases where, where you just can't do what I'm advocating. But just if you can, do it. You know, if, if Vern was further away, he would, you know, if he was 10 feet out, I would be much happier. It's a very nice, you know, I think it's a good choice of background. You know, it sort of has that kind of literate, you know, educated, this guy is speaking as an expert, you know, so there, you know, it, it, it just, it's a nice chair, you know, all that's good. So I would say, you know, I would rate that fairly highly for, for student, uh, student film. And the interesting thing is, is good audio is as important as good video. And in fact, I think that uh, when you have bad audio, it actually degrades the picture. Because people are using a lot more of their brain power to actually hear what the person is saying. It takes so much more work to listen to this bad audio and sort of interpret it as a really great audio where it's just like listening to somebody in the room. Um, then uh, it's, it's just, it detracts from the, the whole thing. So I, I feel, you know, I pay a lot of attention to audio. Uh, I, I put a lot of energy into the audio because if the audio is really solid, it helps enhance everything. When I'm interviewing somebody, I'll nod my head. I ought, one thing I do, and I, I encourage you to do this, is that I, I try to set myself up next to my camera so that I make eye contact with the person talking try to make it a dialogue between me and that person uh, so that they see me and they see my eyes and when they say something that I'm really interested in or even not I'll nod my head and agree and sort of give them uh, encouragement but not by saying uh-huh yes because those are sometimes hard to get rid of and particularly if they're saying something and you say uh-huh that overlap is is a bit of a problem uh, and that, you know, again, uh, let me show you with my footage. So we're just about to come to another interview. I asked him once, what do you do before you begin working? And he said, oh, I get on my knees and I pray. And I said, what do you pray for? And he said, I pray that God will let me get out of my way. Okay, so in this film, uh, I, put a, I put a painting by the guy who's the subject of the film in the background of every interview. So this is a painting of his. Uh, you'll see that, again, this side of her face is brighter, and this side is a little bit 
darker and it sort of gives a three dimensionality. And this is my backlight that sort of separates her from that back wall. Again, that wall is happening at an angle. Now, what I wanted to, well, the reason I brought this up is you'll see this is true of the other uh, interview, but I didn't really mention it at the time. She is looking just off camera, just a tiny bit off camera. Uh, and that's what I almost always do, is have the person, uh, because if they're looking into the camera, they're, they're not having a relationship with you. So in this case, I'm, I'm, I'm on the fo other side of the camera looking at her, and I'm making eye contact, I'm interacting with her, and we're having a conversation. And it just, it, it makes, you know, for somebody to have a conversation with a human being versus staring into a camera, it's much more personable if they're actually interacting with you and you're having a, a conversation with them. And another thing about that is it means you shouldn't probably be looking down at your notes the whole time the person is talking. You can look at them, interact with them, and then, you know, when they've completed what they're saying, you can look down at your notes. But don't be distracted. Uh, I have a video from the journalism class. Okay. Uh, it's Wednesday. 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 Each piece that I make kind of follows the same process where it starts by chance and then I use order and then finish with um, intuition. I draw coins. I've also done rice spill things like I'd spill a cup of coffee, total random, and then let it dry. And so the stain that it leaves behind at the beginning of the work. Actually, I want to pause for one second. You, you know, her voice is traveling through space to get to the recording device, as opposed to this one. And I, every time I touch it, I mess up core. But um, you know, th this, my voice has to travel eight inches, and it's, it's being recorded. Here you can hear the sound. And then let it dry. You know, it's sort of echoey, like a little boomy. I mean, that's a lot better to me. So the idea is that you can't control what happens. And you know, the great thing is, in this day and age, you know, uh, there was a time when cameras were not as good as they are now. And even a $1,000 camera takes amazing pictures compared to what you could do 10 or 15 years ago. So th this, there's no, I don't think there's any lighting in this. This is just, they set up in her studio, and this is the lighting that was there. And you'll see, you know, it's not, you know, it's not beautiful. But it's perfectly acceptable. And again, one side of the fight, just because that's often the way the lighting falls, there must be a light source somewhere over here that's hitting this side of her face. This side's a little bit less, uh, less bright. But, um, but after it's happened, you control how you want to move forward. Now, let me make a small point. Uh, the, in terms of filmmaking technique, uh, this, uh, the, the filmmakers are choosing to uh, <coughs> dissolve from one piece of audio that's, uh, that's relevant to the next piece of audio that's relevant. So you'll see she's talking about um, the I Ching, right? Funny, so, I my pieces, I so they wanted to move from that discussion of the, of the I Ching to her, I'm, I imagine what she's about to say is how it influences her work. So the way they chose to do that was to dissolve out of one shot and then dissolve into, fade into the other shot. And a more sophisticated technique would have been to have shown, a, if you just did a cutaway of a painting, you would be able to have the audio continuous without that fade out and fade in, which obviously indicates that they're moving from one section to another. <coughs> and you would make the audio edit underneath the shot of the painting. And that way, 
it would sort of be a seamless audio, the way the woman in the strawberry field, that audio was seamless, even though there were sections of that that were minutes apart from each other. It sounds like just one continuous flowing conversation. This, you're very aware of the fact you're taking bits and pieces and using the parts that you want to use and discarding the other parts. So it, a slightly more sophisticated way to do that is to use the footage that you shoot other than the interview. And that's an important point to make too. When you shoot an interview, it's great to get other footage at the same time. Very important. So uh, you might want to show the person at work, at a computer, you know, at their desk doing something. You might want to show them doing what they do professionally. Vern Grubinger, have them out in a field or looking at crops or whatever. And then when you, when you edit the interview, you're able to use that footage to disguise your audio cuts. So you always want to try to get some footage above and beyond the interview. You do the interview, and then you say, well, can we spend five or 10 minutes just filming you doing stuff? What, 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 what would you be doing? Or what is something that we could film that's interesting that, that maybe even relates to what we're talking about in this piece? So here is uh, Jack Maddox. Chosen to be certified organic. Mm -hmm. The main reason I would think is that this farm's been in our family since 1790. I mean, the audio is not terrible, but it's definitely not as good as the Vern Grubiger audio. Oh, you sneaky little. Oh, boy. Well, fortunately, I think it's working better this time. Anyway, uh, the, I'll also point out he's slightly out of focus. Uh, so that is. And this is an example where w what they did not do, they did not zoom in and get focus. They just went, they were wide, you know, it was a wide shot, and they didn't get perfect focus, and so it's, it's a little bit out of focus, which, which is not a great thing. Okay, so this is a film we made for the River Gallery School, and I, I, I want to talk for a second about other shooting other than, doc, uh, than interview, because mostly we've talked about interviews, and I know you guys are going to be filming interviews. But uh, there's another style of filmmaking it's called cinema verite, which in French means cinema of the truth. And it's a style of, of filmmaking where the camera person is, is at some event or some, some human interaction, and they want to try to film it in a way that conveys in the most true way what's happening at that time. So, uh, and that's what, I love to, oh, that's what I love doing. It's sort of like a dance. It's like choreography between you and the subject. Th this is not quite that active. So, this young woman is uh, working with a teacher. And let's just watch. And think about the different kinds of shots that, uh, that I'm choosing to capture to be able to edit this into a nice, coherent little sequence. <laughs> This is a bunch of years ago. So lighter here and then deeply as you go back. Yeah. And then the same here, the colors, the green will be you know, deeper and then places where a little more sunlight is hitting and you can Okay, so let's just look at that sequence real quick. Uh, so you see her interacting with the teacher. Uh, and to be able to edit, you know, I want to be able to cut from one shot to the next. So in this shot, I pan down from them. She starts relating. She, she starts relating to that. So I, so I, sh I pan down to that. Now, that enables my wife, who's the editor, to be able to cut from that first shot back to the girl. What is her name? Gabby. Gabby. Uh, back to Gabby um, without it feeling jumpy or, or uh, you know, um, 
not, you know, not smooth. So now we see her. Now at the same time, she's making this kind of curious drawing, right? And I wanted to establish what the heck it was that she was referencing. So I took this shot, which was, here's the photograph that she's working from. You see the crosses. And I move across to show what she's drawing. Then we cut to her. And again, I pan down to what she's doing. And by a piece of luck, I have this wide shot. And just right, you know, you can see the cross is a little bit more complete. But just as I got to here, I chose to zoom in real quick to get a close shot that then allows you to see even more closely what she's up to, which is when we make that cut from the wider shot to the closer shot. So that is an example of how you shoot. I mean, I'm moving all around. At one point, I'm, I'm in relationship to them like this. To get the shot of the, of the, of the reference, I move around to here. Uh, I'm shooting here wide. I'm shooting here close up. I'm trying to get all the pieces of that puzzle that will allow me to turn this into a nicely edited, smooth uh, thing. So now I don't know that you're going to get that much into cinema verite shooting, but it's something to be aware of and something that you know can make uh, a really smooth production. I mean, that's sort of you know when when I praise my wife's work, uh, I say that she has this great ability to create flow and rhythm, and pace. And that's really what you want to do in a film, is have uh, people really getting on board and traveling along with you. And a lot of that comes from the individual edits and how you're putting your material together. And I, you know, I mean, to me, when I see, and absolutely no offense to the class, when I see that choice to, to uh, dissolve out of a shot sort of mid-sentence, because that's the end of where I'm interested in the audio, and then dissolve into another sentence later on, uh, it just is a little bit awkward and clunky, as opposed to this scene where the conversation and dialogue feels continuous, even though obviously I had to move a lot of different places and get those shots over the course of probably five minutes, you have a sense you understand what was going on between that teacher and that and the girl and what she was doing and how she was doing it. So um, those are just some tips for uh, you know how you want to cover something when you're when you're not doing a simple straight interview. The other thing is is sometimes that interview, like I said, sometimes your interview is while somebody's doing something, while they're working. And then you definitely want to get some alternative shots so that you can edit that audio the way you want to edit it. In some respects, editing is like writing an essay or editing an essay, where you, you're, you, you, are, you have some material. You know, it's not written. It's actual words and pictures. But you want to put that into a coherent whole. And your objective is to take the footage that you've gotten and turn it into a coherent whole. And the way you do that uh, is, is helped a lot when your footage allows you to make the kind of edits and the kind of editing that I'm talking about.